I'm Kathy, and I'm here from Stanford's Life Design Lab. So please don't hold the Stanford part against me. <laughs> uh, what I'm going to talk about with you today is the idea of using design thinking, an innovation process that has driven Silicon Valley companies to success uh, on your own life. So more important than this process are ways of thinking. And I want to start us off by having you close your eyes. Close your eyes, and I want you to picture yourself at 10 years old. Think about what did you want to be when you grew up when you were 10? Maybe there were a variety of things that you had in mind. Close your eyes. All right. I want you to open your eyes. This is the question that the Life Design Lab at Stanford is working on. What do we want to be when we grow up? So we like to say we use design thinking to attack the wicked problem of life and vocational wayfinding. What that really means is we're teaching those classes that help people think about what they want to be when they grow up. And if you thought about yourself as a 10-year-old, you might be remembering how curious you were, how many possibilities there were at that time. And if growing up means giving up those possibilities, maybe a better way to say this would really be not about growing up, but what we want to grow into as our life journey unfolds. So whenever I talk about this work with folks, people of all ages will say to me, I need to take that class. And I think the reason that people say that is we all get stuck. We all feel sometimes at transitions in our lives like this cow. There's no way to move forward. And we get stuck because there are things that we believe to be true that just aren't true. Psychologists call these dysfunctional beliefs. And I'm going to just mention a few. I'm sure you don't have any of these, but maybe somebody you know does. The first one, sometimes when we're in transition, this is the question people ask us. Well, what's your passion? How many people like this question? Yeah, like, like three. <laughs> yeah, this is not the best question. It implies that you should have a passion, and if you don't, just go to the back of the line, can't give you any help, you know, let us know when you got it all figured out. It turns out that psychologists have studied this question. In fact, Bill Damon over at the Center for the Study of Adolescent Research surveyed a large number of folks and he learned that only 20% of us can identify and articulate a singular passion that will drive our lives. That means 80% of us are out of luck with this question. And furthermore, additional researchers into this question of passion and meaning making, they have determined that passion usually comes second. What comes first is engagement and curiosity, that thing that you had when you were 10 and you were willing to try anything. So as a foundational question, as a seminal question, what's your passion? Not very useful. Here's another one. You should know where you're going by now. Yeah. When I was about 15 in high school, I figured by the time I'm 25, I will have it all figured out. I'm 45. I'll let you know when it happens. <laughs> if you ask my students now, they'll say 30. should have it all figured out by 30. But what does that even mean, all figured out? We're going to hear from lots of different speakers today about the future of work, about how life is really changing fast around us. And so this idea that we would know exactly where we are going, that we have a singular destination, I'm not sure that makes sense. Life is a winding road. Lots of things are going to happen. And so the idea that we should have a deadline by which we have it all figured out, that just creates anxiety. It doesn't serve us. Here's another one. Be the best version of you. <laughs> All right. So you know, that then leads to these additional questions, like, are you sure this is the best one? Are you really living the best life? Are you, you wouldn't be settling. I don't want you to be settling, settling. So that implies that there is one best version. I think this comes from business, right? We have this age-old saying, is that the good is the enemy of the better, and the better is the enemy of the best. But in the Life Design Lab, we like to say looking at the unattainable best prevents us from working on all the accessible betters. 
And further, what does best even mean? Let me tell you a little story. This is my daughter, Laurel. She's four here. She's graduating from preschool. In her preschool graduation ceremony, they asked all of the preschoolers to walk across the stage and to announce what they wanted to be when they grew up. So, you know, they're walking across the stage. First kid comes up and he says, when I grow up, I want to be a fireman. The other group claps. Next kid walks up. When I grow up, I want to be an ophthalmologist. I'm pretty sure that one of those kids' the parents was an ophthalmologist. <laughs> My daughter gets up there and she says, when I grow up, I want to be a hairdresser. And the group kind of laughed. And then the woman next to me leaned over and she said, are you sure that's the best choice? Now, to the woman's credit, my two-year-old was sporting an excellent haircut, courtesy of my four-year-old. So, <laughs> so that wasn't a completely ridiculous question to ask. But I would say that this really gets to the point that we start judging really early what the right choice for a career is. Really early. This idea of, hey, if you just get the right job, everything will work out. You'll have the best life. If you just go to the right school, go to Berkeley, you'll be all set. If you just marry the right person, if you just live in the right place. And so all of this creates anxiety for us. Instead of being able to work on things, make the life that we have a little bit better, a little bit better, we're thinking about, well, what's the best? And it keeps us stuck. So if we're stuck, we're going to need to think like designers. And designers are particularly good at getting unstuck because they have a job where they spend all of their time getting stuck and unstuck, trying to come up with innovative new products. And they think in a particular way. They have a culture of innovation. And that culture starts with talking to people who are different from them, getting some radical ideas that they wouldn't have had. And you're going to have the opportunity to do that today. You're going to be in a room with all kinds of different interesting people. And so you can think like a designer and get some ideas from your peers. Designers are good at reframing, thinking about a way to think about a problem that's different than the way they stated it originally so that they can have more room to solve. They're constantly curious. They hang on to that 10-year-old self and really look into things, explore. They're mindful of process, and that means they know where they are in this process. They're able to break problems down into manageable pieces, and they're able to realize, hey, this is a time when I need more ideas, or this is a time when I need to come up with some experiments, some prototypes to test the ideas I have. And finally, they have a bias to action. And by that I mean, even when they don't have data, they're willing to try things and do things and build their way forward to get that data. They don't just stay in their heads and analyze. All right, so we teach a 10-week class at Stanford about this. You guys are much smarter, so we're going to do it in 10 minutes. <laughs> so no, I'm going to give you four ideas that people who have taken the class or read the book Designing Your Life have said are extremely useful to them. So here we go. First one, building a compass. When people are thinking about their lives, we have talked to them, done some empathy work with them, and we've asked them, what are you thinking about? And they are often thinking about meaning making, about creating purpose in their lives. It turns out psychologists have studied this too. And what they've determined is there are three things, who you are, what you believe, and what you do, that if you are able to connect the dots between them, you're able to construct a story of meaning and purpose, why you do what you do, and why it matters. So we ask our students to write two reflective pieces, to think for a minute about why do they do what they do? What's the purpose of work? Why do they work? What matters to them in work? What parts of work do they find fulfilling? And then we also ask them to look at what's this thing of life about, their philosophy of life. So these small questions. We're thinking about what are our values? What spiritual beliefs might we have? Why do we think humans are on this planet? 
So we write down some thoughts about both of these things, and then we compare them. Hey, how do these things fit together? Are they coherent? Do they make sense? Are there opportunities to become more, more coherent? Because what psychologists have found is that connecting these dots increases meaning making. And we just talked about the fact that there's this dysfunctional belief that you would know exactly where you were going. So if you don't know the location, maybe a useful thing to have, I don't know how many of you guys are trail runners or hikers, would be a compass. So you can set your direction, have an idea, and then you can find the place that you're looking for, even if you don't know exactly what it is yet. So that's the first idea, creating a compass. Here's another idea, the idea of reframing problems to get unstuck. When we think about solving problems, we think about the process of innovation. We often think about a wall of Post-its. I don't know, maybe, maybe you guys don't. Maybe that's just a Stanford thing. But when I talk to people about, about ideation, they're like, ah, a wall of Post-its. I'm going to have a brainstorm. But you know, the brainstorm is great. But if you're brainstorming on the wrong problem, it's really not that helpful. And so a couple things have to happen before you can come up with ideas. How many of you have a friend, not you, a friend who would, you know, you go to coffee with them all the time and they have a thing that they're stuck on. It's like, I, I, my boss is driving me crazy or got this family situation that's really frustrating and you've had coffee with them for years, and the story doesn't really change, and they're not really doing anything about it, but they got a lot to say about it. And you're kind, and you say, like, yeah, that's, that's tough, right? And, it, and you're being a good friend. You're listening. Well, I would argue that in that case, they haven't done a, a pretty important thing. No, they haven't signed into the Wi-Fi. Um, they haven't done an important thing. They haven't accepted this as a problem they want to work on. So before we can come up with ideas, we need to accept that we actually want to make progress on a problem. So that's got to happen first. And then we've got to think about, how is it that we're defining the problem? Because how we ask the question is going to set up the solution space for the answers we get. And sometimes we have embedded in the question a singular solution. We're anchored to it. We really want that one. And if we can't get that one, we're stuck. Let me give you an example. So I was at a workshop recently. Oh man, this really wants me to sign into this Wi-Fi. <laughs> All right. I was at a workshop recently, and we set up this exercise. We said, hey, Think of something you want to work on where you're stuck, and we'll have you set up with a partner, and we'll, they'll give you some ideas of how to get unstuck. So there are two guys there sitting there, and they were not looking too happy with this exercise. So I walked over, and I said, hey, what's going on? What problem are you working on? And Brad said, well, here's the thing. I am trying <laughs> to figure out I mean, the part, part of my life where I would really like to find a partner and settle down, and I can't find uh, a gal to settle down with where I am, and so I'm, my partner is trying to help me think about where can I move to find love? <laughs> I said, where do you live? He said, I live in Chicago. I said, wow, nobody in Chicago, huh? <laughs> so he was anchored to the idea that the solution to finding love was to move. Right? We're just, it's, geog it's geography based. That's the problem. So I said, well, you know, what if we just let that anchor go? What if we say instead, how might I find connection and love regardless of geographic location? His partner said, I can come up with some ideas for that. <laughs> so off they went. Now they were not coming up with a list of cities, but they were coming up with a list of things that Brad could try to meet some people who he might connect with. So the framing really matters. If you say, where can I move to find love? Now you're talking about moving. But if you say, how can I find love regardless of location? Now you're talking about finding connection, the real problem that he wanted to solve. So I invite you to think about problems that you've been working on for a while. First, 
Did you accept them, or are they just a circumstance that you want to talk about and get some, you know, some sympathy around, or do you really want to work on it? And then second, if you have a problem where you're stuck, are you anchored to one solution? If so, is there some way that you could reframe the problem, state it in a different way to give yourself more room for ideas? So that's idea number two. All right, so if you've got a problem framed, maybe you're working on your life, for example, you want to get lots of ideas. It turns out Chip and Dan Heath in their book Decisive have studied companies making decisions. And they've determined that if they're making a decision and they've got two options only, the chance of a favorable outcome is less than 50%. Introduce a third option, and now the chance of a favorable outcome goes up to over two thirds. Big difference. The power of three options cannot be overstated. It's magic. At the end of our class, we ask students to think about the next five years of their lives, the paths they might explore. And we ask them to do it in a very particular way. We ask them to create three unique, very different five-year plans for themselves. We call them odyssey plans. Life one, this is the life that they're living today, that you are living today. But it goes great, fantastic. Everything is working out. You're getting the promotion you want. You're living in the house that you want. Things are going superbly. Sometimes people ask me, well, why would you have it be so positive? Like, life isn't really like that. And I would answer, designers are always trying to design to make things better. So we don't design to make things worse. I have been on teams where things have gone poorly, but it wasn't our intention. So when we visualize our life one, we visualize it in the most positive way possible. Life two, what if life one can't happen? Not because you aren't awesome. You are still as awesome as you ever were. But something has changed in the environment around you. Robots are now doing that job. So sorry, you're going to need to do something different. And usually people have some sort of side hustle or an interest that they have that they could imagine becoming the main event. That's life two. Life three is the wild card life. What if you didn't have to worry about financial constraints? You had enough money to live on. Wouldn't that be wonderful? I hear somebody say that. <laughs> That'd be amazing. What if you didn't have to worry about anybody laughing at you? You didn't have to worry about status. I hear this a lot from Stanford students, and I bet it would be the same for some of you. You know, I can't do that thing because what would people say? What would people say? A student came to me, he had made these three Odyssey plans, and his third one was becoming a volleyball coach. And as he told me about them, he was talking about, hey, I could get a job at Genentech, or I could do this other thing, and, or I could be a volleyball coach. I said, wow, you seem really excited about that volleyball coach idea. He said, yeah, but I can't be a volleyball coach. What would people say? You went to Stanford to be a volleyball coach? My parents would be furious. So, that didn't feel accessible to him. He wrote it down, though, and that was important. I'm going to tell you why in a minute. But in the, at the end of the day, the writing down of these three radically different options allows people to get at things that they may have forgotten about. We know life one. We know that story. But there are things, things that we wanted to do when we were 10, that we've put away. And so making lives two and lives three we start thinking about, oh yeah, there are some things that I left behind that I'm still curious about that I still might want to pursue. People don't often just chuck it all and dive into life three, but what they often do is they take pieces of those two lives and they reintroduce them into life one to make life one a little bit better. We're not going for the best, we're going for iterating to become better. The other thing that happens when you write these down is you're able to share them with other people. I said to that student, you're really worried about your parents' opinion of this volleyball coach idea. You know, Parents Weekend is coming up. Why don't you tell them about all three plans? You don't have to tell them that this is the one you're excited about. Just share them out there and see what reaction you get. Just let me test the water a little bit. I said, all right, I'll, I'll do that. He comes back to my office hours about two weeks later after Parents Weekend. 
And he goes, you will never believe what happened. I said, oh, what happened? He said, I showed my Odyssey plans to my parents. And they said, you've always wanted to be a volleyball coach. <laughs> I said, OK, well, do you think that you could become a volleyball coach? You know, do, you, do you play volleyball? He says, yeah, actually, I play on the Stanford team. I said, OK, well, that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good starting place for that life. That isn't as wild as, as you might think. But you write these down, you have a chance to notice for yourself, hey, what matters to you? And you also have a chance to recruit people into your process. And they might be remarkably supportive. You never know. So I mentioned that oftentimes people don't just chuck everything and go for life three. Uh, and that's because chucking everything and going for life three, it doesn't always work. You know, I'm going to abandon my job and become a bartender in Belize. I don't know. That seems, <laughs> seems a little risky. So. What we need to do then is actually prototype. How can we reduce risk? How can we run some experiments so that if we decide we want to pursue one of these things, these ideas we came up with, we have a chance at success? All right. So prototyping, why do we prototype? Well, we were prototype to reduce risk. I want to find out if this is a good idea before I go all in. And we prototype to ask interesting questions. One of the questions my student had was, could I live on a volleyball coach's salary? Right? He can find that out. He can run some prototypes. He can talk to some people. Maybe we're interested in exposing some assumptions. We think it's going to be one way. But is it really? Or is that just what we think? So could we test things, run an experiment to find out if we're right? And fundamentally, we're trying to sneak up on our future. And involving other people in our ideas allows them to then be on our team to support our journey. Because this is, you know, life is not something we do by ourselves, people. Like, we gotta, we gotta rely on each other. So we gotta involve other people in our ideas. And if we start early, we're laying the groundwork for opportunity for ourselves. Now, if you're making a product, say you're making Google Glass, you might wanna prototype by, like, finding out if anybody wants to wear a camera on their head. But in life, we aren't necessarily going to put things together with cardboard and hot glue. We're going to have to do it another way. So there are two ways to prototype that we know of in life. First one is prototype conversation. You might have heard of it as information interviewing, or just taking someone to coffee and getting their story. There's a science fiction writer, William Gibson. He says, the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. What that means is there's somebody out there in the world doing the thing that you want to do. You can go find them, talk to them, and hear their story. When you do that, you get a feeling of narrative resonance. Does this story sound like me? Yeah, maybe so. Or maybe, oh, man, I thought I wanted to do that, and that sounds awful. I'm not going to do it after all. But you have a chance to take advantage of somebody else's experience. And it's super cheap. You can buy a cup of coffee at Starbucks for $3.50. You don't have to do anything else just to get a felt sense, right? Hey, is this a good story that I think I might want to be interested in pursuing? So if we're going after this idea of opportunity, right? One of the things that also can happen as you have these conversations is you start sounding like you know what you're talking about. Because you talk to a bunch of people who are doing the thing, and now you know the language of that area. You know, hey, what's, what's going on in that space? What questions do they have? And so if it moves beyond getting a story and having that conversation to something like an actual job interview, you have good questions to ask. You have things to say that are relevant to the situation. So these prototype conversations, they both allow you to reflect, hey, is this something that I want? To dip your toe, reduce risk, and then to create opportunity for, for yourself by having these conversations and learning more. Now, conversations go well, and you're thinking, all right, I'm, I'm, this is feeling good. I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to do more. Now, what about having a prototype experience? Because they're more than just our cognitive brain. We're our whole self. 
our full body. And so maybe we want to have an embodied experience of the thing. Now, what, what does that mean? That means maybe you shadow somebody for a day. I tell my students, you can intern. We're a little older. I don't know how many of us are ready to actually go and intern, leave our job and do that for some period of time. But we can do things like volunteer for an hour, work on a project with somebody, just go sit in their space. I don't know about you guys, but there's a felt sense of, of a space, right? Some labs, everybody's got their head down, they're not talking to each other. Right? Other times, people are talking to one another. You see people who look like you, who feel like you, who you want to hang around with, who you'd like to be like. That's a good indicator, a felt sense in your body. Hey, this is a place, this is a type of work I could see myself doing. And it doesn't, again, cost very much to go and have those couple hour experience, sit in a place for a day. You can even just be doing your own work, but just in a new spot. So that felt embodied experience can teach us a lot. I was walking, I, I spend a lot of time walking. I'm recovering from an Achilles injury. And so I walk out on a trail near my house. And I'll be honest, I was practicing this talk. So I'm walking along, you know. <laughs> And, uh, and I saw this woman, and she was walking toward me, and she had on, and this isn't just a regular, like a bike path in Fremont, so you know, this isn't like the Himalayas. Um, <laughs> and she's wearing huge hiking boots and a big pack, I mean, really large. And, uh, and so I was kind of curious what was going on there, so I asked her, I said, oh, are you training for something? And she said, yeah. My friend asked me if I would hike the Appalachian Trail with her. So, but I haven't been doing this and backpacking in a long time. I'm a little older now. She probably looked like she was maybe about 60. And so she said, so I decided I would get out my old backpack and put on my boots and just load it up with a whole bunch of stuff and walk on the, the Alameda Creek Trail here and just see how I felt <laughs> before I told her I would do it. And I thought, my god, this is like the best example of prototyping that I've ever seen. It's beautiful, right? She, she realized, hey, I'm going to have a felt experience. How does it feel to carry this pack and wear these boots again at my age before I tell my friend, yeah, let's plan a month-long backpacking trip? It didn't cost her anything to put on that stuff and have that, that feeling. She said, you know, it's hard, but I think if I train, I can probably do it. I said, awesome. That's amazing. Bill likes to tell a story about a woman who came to one of our workshops who was thinking about going back to school. She had been working as an accountant. She was pretty into it. But she was realizing, hey, I want to do something that has a little bit more meaning. And I'm really curious about education and whether I can apply my skills in a nonprofit educational setting. So I'm thinking about going back to school, she says. And she was probably about my age, mid-40s. And he said, OK, well, then, you know, are you going to, are you going to do it? What's, what's your plan? And she said, I don't know, because I think that it sounds good to go back to school. But I'm not sure I want to work that hard. I'm not sure it'll be interesting enough. And plus, I don't know if I'd fit in. There's lots of young people there. I've heard these millennials are kind of scary. <laughs> so I don't know how it is at Berkeley, but at Stanford, we have this super long ad drop period, three weeks long. And during that time, you know, students can run around and, and try out different classes. And nobody checks ID at the door, especially at big lecture halls. So Bill said, why don't you just put on a Stanford t-shirt, pretend that you go here, and just check it out. So she did. So she went in, she put on a Stanford t-shirt, and she went into some education classes and sat down and you know, enjoyed the lecture. And she came back, and she said to us, it was amazing. I was really interested in the material. I was excited. And not only that, I ended up talking to some students next to me. And they were really nice. And they were really interested in me, because I was different from them, and I was coming back to school. And so we had lots of interesting conversations. And in fact, now I've set up some prototype conversations with them. So she had a felt experience that this might be something that would be working for her. And that led her to make decisions more with confidence. She'd reduce her risk, and now she could move forward. So I invite you to think about this idea in your life. 
there's a big step you're thinking about taking. Is there something small you could do, a little experiment, a prototype, that would help move you forward? So these are four big design thinking ideas that perhaps could be useful to you or someone that you know. Build your compass. Think about why you work, what your view of life is, and how you can connect the dots to create a story of meaning for yourself. Consider reframing of problems. Is there a way that you can state something that you're working on that'll give you more room to solve it? Three. Think three possible alternatives. Not two. Think three. And make them as widely different as you can. Because you're going to learn a lot from checking out all of those different thoughts that maybe you've put aside. And then prototype. Set the bar low and then clear it. It'll work well. These are things that'll help you design a life where you thrive. So as we're going through this journey called life, we're all thinking about how we can be more. You know, more passionate, more STEM capable, more connected, more kale loving. <laughs> but I'd like to say that maybe this design thinking process, this designing your life process, can just help us be more human. If you remember nothing else from this talk, as you go out today and you're talking to people, doing things, I want you to remember that you can do this. We know that you can do it. Hundreds of students have done it. Thousands of people have read the book, Designing Your Life, and they have done it, and you can do it too. It's really pretty simple. Get curious. Remember those things that you're curious about, that you want to explore. Talk to people. There are people out there who are doing it who can help you on your path. And don't be afraid to try things. Thank you.